This video is sponsored by Layer of the Spider Lord, a new D&D campaign set in the world of Astro Mythos, now on Kickstarter. Top of the morning to you and welcome to Monster of the Week, the only show on the internet that thinks it is absolutely nutty. There is no official stat block for leprechauns in D&D 5th edition. Seriously, they're like one of the most notorious fey creatures from folklore, maybe ever, and they've received no love in 5e. But that's why we're here today. I really wanted to wear green for this video, but I film in front of a green screen, so just pretend I'm being festive. I have green socks on, I swear. As always, my goal today is to go over the Leprechaun's lore, ecology, and publication history. Then we're going to finally convert it into 5th edition D&D and go over some plot hooks and story ideas for how you might use a Leprechaun at your game table. These little tricksters are extremely versatile. This is a video I've known I was going to make since I started doing this channel, and I am stoked to finally be giving them the spotlight. So, let's see if we can't find ourselves a pot of gold. I'm going to assume most of you watching this right now have at least a vague idea of what a leprechaun is. They are one of the most popular mythological creatures and they have a way of showing up everywhere in pop culture, from horror movies to children's breakfast cereal. Which is totally valid for adults to eat by the way. Live your life. They're the little humanoid fey folk that wear green, smoke pipes, and sow mischief. But their history as it relates to Dungeons and Dragons is really interesting. Leprechauns got their start in D&D extremely early, appearing in the very first AD&D monster manual. And just look at that artwork. Even in the pages of an RPG book, they're causing trouble. There are four of them total, but only one of them is actually where the monster art is supposed to be. We can see one of them is lounging on top of the monster text, the other is up in the top corner messing with the page's margin text, and yet another one is riding the giant leech in the artwork next door. This is honestly super charming, and I can't think of a better way to represent what leprechauns are all about than having them literally mess with the contents of the book that they're supposed to be in. Because after all, the leprechaun really is supposed to embody that trope of the mischievous fey creature. They aren't out here trying to commit atrocities like so many of the other monsters we talk about on this channel. Think less war crimes and more battle pranks. Their appearance in 2nd edition is pretty much the same as their appearance in AD&D, except we get some new artwork which I think is very fun and charming. They are also one of the only creatures in all of D&D's history to skip a generation, only to then be reprinted again later. Leprechauns were not present in 3rd edition D&D, however they did come back for 4th edition if only for a moment. They make their one and only appearance in Dungeon Magazine of all places, in issue 211 as part of an adventure that involves a stint in the Feywild. This is also where we get some of the best artwork I have ever seen for a D&D monster. Just a bunch of leprechauns dancing around this poor elf as she openly weeps. Look at them, just clowning on her. And this, unfortunately, was the last time they were ever printed in an official capacity. As far as their actual lore goes, it's pretty well tied to their mythological lore in the real world, except with a bit more of a D&D spin on it. They are in that genre of fey that would absolutely have a YouTube prank channel if the internet was a thing in their world. According to legend, they like to move between the Feywild and the material world, not just to prank its denizens, but also to find good wine and spirits. If they like the local tavern keeper, maybe they even leave a few gold pieces behind. If they don't, good luck trying to stop them, because leprechauns are masters of being unseen. They can turn invisible at will, and have lots of tricks up their sleeves to put other creatures off the trail. This of course is where the rumors stem from that if you actually manage to catch a leprechaun, it will buy its freedom from you by revealing its hidden pot of gold or breakfast cereal. I wanna know where the gold is. I want the gold. Give me the gold. I want the gold. In D&D lore, it's unclear if this legend is actually true or not, but let's just worry about catching one first. And if that's your goal, you will need a very good understanding of what you're up against. Wow. 
this may come as a surprise, but leprechauns don't really like fighting. When push comes to shove, however, they do have a few abilities that can help them out. Their only actual attack option is the use of a dagger, which ironically isn't going to cut it in most cases. But something they do have is a bunch of great spells. They can cast Invisibility, Minor Illusion, Prestidigitation, and Shillelagh at will. Shillelagh. These are all useful in their own regard, but the headline here is Invisibility. As CR2 creatures, they're not going to be taking on horrible monsters by any means, but most things they interact with on a daily basis are going to have a real hard time dealing with an invisible creature. The other spells are mostly just meant to enhance their sneaky tendencies. The exception of course being Shillelagh. That's just on there because the spell is inspired by actual Irish folklore much like the Leprechaun itself, so I felt it was appropriate to include and Sometimes a leprechaun just needs to bonk a bitch with a magic stick. On their more limited list of spells that can only be cast a few times each day, they've got Blur, which makes them harder to hit, Mirror Image, which makes them harder to hit, and Misty Step, which makes them harder to hit, and gives them a good escape option. I also opted to give them a spell called Nether's Mischief, which is a lesser known arcane incantation from Fizzban's Treasury of Dragons. This spell doesn't deal any damage, but it does have a randomly determined effect that is relatively harmless, but still very useful. For example, it might fill the air with the scent of apple pie and charm everyone who fails their saving throw in the vicinity. It's a great spell, and it's very on brand. We're all about monster brand recognition here on the Dungeon Dad channel. <laughs> But aside from dishing out the occasional battle prank and smoking on that good good, what exactly can a leprechaun offer a dungeon master in D&D? Since you asked nicely, I think it's time we talked about a few. Some people in the Crichton area of Mobile say a leprechaun has taken up residence in their neighborhood. A leprechaun. NBC 15's Brian Johnson has more. Leprechauns can make excellent antagonists for a low-level D&D campaign when you want to mix things up. Instead of the typical story beats involving orcs or goblins attacking the town, maybe there's a small mystery to be solved. Perhaps the local tavern has had half their wine shipment stolen every month for the past three months now, and it's starting to really take its toll on the business. Assuming bandits are likely responsible, maybe they hire the adventuring party to go investigate, only for them to eventually discover that it is indeed a bunch of leprechauns who are coming from a nearby portal to the Feywild to help themselves to a few pints. However this problem is resolved, it could be a great way to introduce the concept of a Feywild portal that is slowly encroaching on the nearby village. Maybe the leprechauns were just the start, and there's something much more malevolent with designs on the peaceful village. And who knows, depending on how the situation was handled, maybe the leprechauns actually become allies to the party as they venture deeper into the Feywild to discover why this portal has suddenly opened. You could also take a page from the leprechaun movies and just make them absolute horrible little nightmare creatures if you want to. I mean, they might not cause a ton of damage, but your average commoner doesn't have that many hit points. And if you really want to make them a bloodthirsty threat, just give them a sneak attack option similar to what the rogue has, and you've got yourself a little serial killer gang of murderous fey creatures. Listen, don't ever let your creativity be stifled. That's the lesson here. I also love the idea of exploring what actually happens if someone manages to catch a leprechaun. No matter what the outcome, it's kind of funny because if the players decide they want to try to catch a leprechaun so it will show them where it keeps its gold, either one of two things is going to happen. Either the leprechaun actually has the gold or it's all just a legend and the leprechaun explains it does not have the gold. And now, since they've messed with his leprechaun, who knows what other Feywild friends it might have to send after the party in an act of revenge if they're not careful. Or maybe it just straight up lies to them, says it does have a pot of gold, leads them on a weeks long wild goose chase just for a laugh. God, they're just such little magical jerks, aren't they? Now I don't really have a clever segue for this next part, but a friend of mine is working on an incredible D&D project that I'm stoked to share with you guys. So I'm gonna just take a moment and talk about this week's sponsor. The stars are vanishing one by one. Men wage war now with the stars, with those who give them warmth and light. The cosmos fears and hates mankind, but men were corrupted against their will. Men do the bidding of black holes, of evil spider stars called photovores. They seek to slay the stars and extinguish all light in the cosmos, 
and so the stars fought back. Layer of the Spider Lord is a 5e compatible adventure based on the original fantasy world of Astro Mythos created by John Sideriadis. John is an incredible artist and illustrator, and I actually had a chance to meet him at PAX Unplugged last December. The guy is super passionate about what he does, and he's created this entire world of mythology that I fell in love with as soon as I saw the artwork. The book itself has a bunch of new spells, creatures, items, NPCs, maps, locations, and of course, an entire campaign. The focus of the campaign itself is for mid to high level play, and I think it looks like an awesome way to recapture the imagination of any DMs or players out there who are looking for something a little bit new. The Kickstarter for this beautiful project is live right now, so if you want to pick it up, check out the link in the description or the pinned comment of this video. There are lots of awesome stretch goals, including a soundtrack, which I'm always a huge sucker for, and there are a few pledge levels, some of which include these awesome miniatures. Definitely do not sleep on this. John also has a book dedicated to Astro Mythos that's separate from this Kickstarter he put out a while ago, but I picked up a copy of it from him while I was at PAX, and it is mind-blowing. He's created such a cool world, and I cannot wait to play D&D in that world. So thank you so much again, John, and to the Lair of the Spider Lord Kickstarter for bringing us here today to talk about leprechauns. <laughs> And I also want to give a shout out to our randomly selected patron of the week, Media Freak Double Zero. Thank you so much for freaking out about my media. I truly appreciate the support. And thank you for watching. As always, there is a fifth edition conversion of the Leprechaun in the description down below, which you can find in the form of a Google document. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, of course, the PDF, high res PDF Patreon style stat block is over on the Patreon page, which you can also find a link to in the description down below. And if you're not already a patron, please consider checking it out because you get a cool thing and it helps support me and the channel and the content we're trying to make here. Also, if there is a monster that you would like to see show up in an episode of Monster of the Week, please let me know in the comments down below and who knows? you might just see it show up on an episode of Monster of the Week. We've also got a Monster Suggestions channel on the Dungeon Dad Discord and a bunch of other channels where people talk about all kinds of neat stuff. You can check that out down there too. Also over here, I just want to briefly mention, I do have a second channel now. I know I've been going on about this the past few videos and I promise the plugs for channel two are going to stop pretty soon, but I've got some stuff that I'm going to be uploading over there in the next few days or weeks if it hasn't already gone up already. I know when this video is coming out, it's going to come out the week of St. Patrick's Day. I'm not sure when those other videos are coming out, but there's going to be some more stuff over there soon. So if you're not already subscribed and you want to see more of this, but not specifically related to the content that we're usually doing here, you can check that out down there on the Dungeon Dad Dabbles channel because we're dabbling in stuff. That's pretty much all I've got for you this week, though. Happy St. Patty's Day and remember to drink responsibly. Thank you so much for watching. Until next week. What's this? Another monster from the stars? Dungeon Dad takes to the stars to investigate another concoction from the old school days of Spelljammer. They used to be elves, but through cruel experimentation they've become something else. Biochemical super soldiers? Bloodthirsty war machines? Or simply a misunderstood casualty of war? Next episode, Bionoid. Tune in next time for lots more fan service.